Hi, everybody. Welcome to our very first in a series of pub talks about industrial security that we're looking to host. We've purposely designed these events to be more informal with your attendees, hoping that it offers a more personal experience and that you're encouraged to participate. Um, what we should do first, though, is have Liz go over our logistics. Liz? Thanks, Mary Beth. Yeah, thank you again all for joining us. Uh, before we get started with the event, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. So you'll notice that there are several widgets at the bottom of the screen. Here you can access resources, submit questions, and view sp speaker bios. So you can learn a little bit more about our presenters. <laughs> if you are experiencing technical difficulties at any time during the event, please click on the help widget, or you can also put a question into the Q&A, and we'll make sure to get you some help there. Um, and then our panel members will all remain on the line to answer questions at the end of the webinar, so make sure to submit your questions throughout the event, as well as at the end during our Q&A section. Um, but I think that's it on my end, Mary Beth. I will kick it back to you. Thanks, Liz. And folks, feel free to enter in any questions. We're going to be monitoring that, and again, we want this to be really educational. So all of you, I want you to envision this. Your work day is over. Well, if you can, any of you can say that your work is ever really over. <laughs> You've grabbed your beverage of choice and you just sat down in your favorite happy hour spot. You realize that the table next to you is having a great conversation about different OT and industrial challenges that they've encountered. And it really piques your interest. So today, we're going to eavesdrop on four people that literally have decades of cybersecurity experience. The slide that is going to come up is going to introduce you to Richard, Henry, Lane, and Tyler. These guys are um, bloggers, architects, researchers, engineers, authors, and just in general, really really passionate about security. So, hey, Richard, what are you guys chatting about today? <laughs> well, th thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, and I'll add, I'll add in as far as that uh, uh, breadth of experience, we have some hands-on <laughs> experience as well. So everything from academia to, uh, to being on the floor. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this would uh, be a, uh, you know, I guess a pretty common happy hour, if you will, uh, coming out of the office or coming out of the plant and uh, what we're dealing with today, um, and then certainly what we're dealing with tomorrow, um, security. Um, so in that regard, I mean, I, um, you know, I've got a couple questions, you know, that are always kind of in my mind, um, but uh, sitting around with my, my table mates and my uh, audience table mates, um, and Tyler, maybe I'll, I'll turn it to you um, with, you know, from a from an OT security standpoint, um, again, we have a lot of varied experiences and perspectives and so forth. But Tyler, what is what is at the top of your list as far as OT security is concerned? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a lot of it is that that low hanging fruit. Um, one of the things that even today um, I was looking at the uh, latest in the uh, CISTA industrial. Uh, alerts to what was on there and what was new and the very first one on the list was was hard-coded credentials and I think one of the things that that gets me every time when we think about OT security is that whole idea of, of what's old is new again things that we were fixing in the 90s in IT are just being discovered in OT as we start to do a lot of the OT, IT OT convergence and so you know this one was hard-coded credentials it in my opinion, wasn't scored properly from a CVSS standpoint. Um, it had an invalid score, in my opinion. It was really being underplayed, um, the risk of it. And so I think the, one of the big things that I notice is that we, we have all these little issues, whether it's systems that don't require passwords sitting on you know the factory floor, or it's these systems that are going onto our networks 
where the vendor says, well, our best practice is to not plug it into your LAN. Therefore, you have this in a private control <laughs> network and it's completely secure. Well, people don't. I mean, we can see Henry's laughing already, right? People don't actually do that. And so I think for me, the biggest thing is just getting that, you know, sort of getting your ducks in a row and and really getting that low hanging fruit cleaned up. And I'm, I'm sure Henry laughing away there wants to talk a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, it, it's obviously that um, people are going to want to have remote access into these plants. And so those types of devices are inherently insecure. And especially as you open up to different systems that may be not as secure as you would expect them to be, even outside the plant. Um, those are the things that I find is being pretty risky because you may not control that that environment, you may do the best you can and do a good job at the plant level at the OT side. But then as you start to open up to um, maybe IT convergence or even to cloud services, uh, your, your risk there is that you don't know how those are secured. And so you definitely want your low lying fruit to be, you know, taken care of, like Tyler was saying. So I guess, Henry, just to follow up on that, I mean, um, it's like the, I mean, the train has left the station as far as connectivity, right? I mean, we, we've seen recent events where it was connectivity issues. Um, and I mean, whether it's, and then the industrial IoT, you know, industry 4.0, um, every data person ever wants more and more and more. Um, what are, I mean, what are some of the best, I guess, tips or T you know, tricks or what have you, because remote access just seems like it's it's going to happen. How, how, how do you mitigate that risk? So at your, you, you want to establish a uh, security perimeter that you say this, this is the plant. This is where the data is coming from. Um, then you want to put in um, some kind of uh, restrictor or firewall at that point, and possibly even a DMZ where you can push the data from the plant into the DMZ that all these guys, these data off takers want. And then from that DMZ, you allow only certain, um, you know, connections to happen by mm -hmm. source, destination, protocol, those types of things. And you make that very strict. Um, so th that yeah. would be my suggestion that when you do open up your plant to pushing out data for these guys to analyze and make, you know, the processes better. Um, you do want to have them secured with this, some devices. And also you probably want to have some, not only secure it, but also be able to show to other folks, auditors and things like that, that they are secure and this is what happened. So. Okay. Some good advice there. I mean, I, I almost, uh, it sounds like a little, uh, I mean, historical um, saber rattling about air gapping, right? I mean, that's where we were, <laughs> right? And we had, you yeah. know, industrial control systems written with uh, without having to worry about security. Um, I mean, I personally have had, uh, I was in the wind energy um, and I had a, a large customer who decided to air gap um, their wind park as their kind of aggressive security measure. And it was a service and support disaster. Um, it wasn't just data people. It was people remotely keeping those turbines up and running, and, and that's how the money's made. Um, so it was an experimentation on trying to retrofit air gapping, <laughs> if you will, um, and and then it just really kind of failed. Um, so so good. I, it, thanks for the, the the like I said tips and tricks there because it is the the new world order uh, with access. Um, uh, Lane, how about you? I I didn't get a chance to turn to you about some of your. Uh, you know, top of mind as far as OT security, um, and then I mean Industry 4.0 and so forth. I mean, there's uh, some ground we've covered here. Go ahead and and, and pick yeah. and choose how you'd like to to jump in um, where where you see fit. I was going to actually extend on Henry and Tyler's conversation, and that yeah. um, these are exactly the things that kind of keep me up at night when I when I look at <laughs> ten years down the road, five years down the road, because the problem with this. Uh, and let's just think about segmentation and firewalling and stuff uh, in terms of opening up firewall holes and stuff with policies. 
the, the thing that I see in the future is scale. And I it, 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 we're going to have to deal with large numbers of devices. And these are actually going to be, these environments are going to be much, much harder to configure and secure because you think about it, every time you change a firewall policy, you open up a door to potentially, you know, a configuration change that's faulty or something like that. We are, so I'm part of a, a group that is trying to currently right now establish what it takes to certify an industrial Internet of Things device from a security perspective, from an ISA 62443 perspective, as we call it. And today we were, had a heated debate on what do we call an edge device in the very near future? Mm -hmm. And um, specifically, what we're trying to say is even a sensor and actuator, if we think about the Purdue model, which some of us might be familiar with, when we go down to the very lowest level of the shop floor, we're dealing with sensors and actuators. And if we go right up to the next level, we might be dealing with programmable logic controllers. Well, right now, these networks are very well confined, like Henry's talking about. We can define very, very tight security perimeters. But in the future, as we start retrofitting or replacing and uh, refurbishing, uh, replacing legacy systems with cheaper and more powerful systems with, uh, in particular, more powerful communication and computing capabilities, and in particular, the ability to communicate over an IP-based network, this is where that scale aspect comes in. You know, I've seen PLCs that are interfaced with, uh, you know, the ability to connect directly to the internet over cellular data network to send data into an AWS cloud. And so when we think about yeah. how that future is gonna be versus the current future, it's really gonna rattle our world in terms of our current security models in the entire I converged ITOT space. And so the scale and complexity of these future environments that are gonna enable Industry 4.0 to me that's a huge challenge in terms of security and innovation and, and, and such. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, so you, you, you tripped across a, another landmine there as far as the ITOT convergence. Um, I mean, I, as you describe it, you know, uh, working uh, from a policy standpoint with IC 6443 to establish, you know, the, the industrial IoT device you know, security, if you will. Um, I know that our IT friends also have their own IoT problems, <laughs> if you will. Um, so there's kind of some shared misery there, if you will. Um, but maybe I'd, I'll start, I'll go around the horn again, but but Tyler, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued from, from your perspective as far as the IT OT convergence. Um, it's, it's either Loch Ness or a Yeti, or it's some scary movie where the monster's right behind you. Um, what, what's your perspective on that convergence and where are we and, and, and how maybe a pr prediction about when that gap actually closes? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because you, you know, you referenced, you know, horror movie monsters. Um, but, you know, we're now seeing horror movies that are built around IoT devices uh, and they feel much more realistic uh, and much more frightening to look at where you see these these devices that are allowing people you know direct access to your network through any number of means and you know there's so many so many little devices out there that people buy to simplify their life and i'm going to hold something up that hopefully appears here but i just got these little things in the other day um simply for for research purposes but this is just designed to push a button um this this little arm moves up and down and pushes a button and you know that's great for automating little tasks and stuff but in order to have that, I now have to have a hub in my home. It has to have a connection to the internet. It has to receive data back in from other services. And so now I've got, you know, in my home, not just these devices that people could potentially connect directly to, um, but I've also got paths in from the various service providers because it does use a cloud-based model. And whether you look at these home I IoT devices or medical IoT devices or military IoT or industrial IoT, any of these devices have that same problem where we've become reliant on various cloud providers that are giving us access to our data either through their systems, which means that you know now we get into those supply chain issues where we have all of these different other cloud service providers that have a path through our network. Um, 
interestingly, and just as an aside, I don't know if anybody's watching the new TV show, The Equalizer, but their last episode <laughs> was literally, um, sorry, not The Equalizer, Leverage Redemption. Their last episode was literally about taking out a power grid. And the the way that they approached it was that it was the compromise of one of the service providers, specifically the payroll provider, and then they followed the chain of interconnecting systems all the way back up until they got inside the power company. And yes, it was a TV show. Yes, they simplified things. But that sort of attack of all these different cloud service providers that we're giving paths in and out of our network, even if it's just temporary, is a really scary thing that I don't think we're looking about, especially in terms of, of ITOT convergence, right? We're we're thinking about them in terms of maybe IT. We're not thinking about what that means to the industrial networks that we've connected to our IT networks. And I mm -hmm. think that's, you know, that's going to be the next round of horror movies. Huh. Um, so taking from that, uh, maybe looking at the sequel, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyone can pipe on to this one. But I mean, do we think that there's going to be some type of, oh, I don't know. ISO cert or some kind of seal of approval or something where uh, these these millions of devices have been identified as some level of security, you know, one through five or what have you, that instead of having to run it through your own lab and, and build your own security practice around it, do you think that the, you know, government or industry is going to come together to establish their own standards? I, I mean, it just, it's going to be a, I don't know, feel like the Hindenburg's kind of you know, left the launch pad um, if this doesn't get corralled. Um, and you mentioned, Tyler, you know, electrical infrastructure and, and certainly all the infrastructures are, are topical right now. Um, so anybody want to chime in on that? I mean, what, what we foresee as far as maybe building in or, re, or demanding or requiring security, greater security? I know that um... – my colleagues and I, Tyler and folks that I work with, uh, we've been talking about this, some type of a, okay, and now my mind goes blank. Um, Tyler, what we, have we talked about? Like a, like a, an organization that could actually like say, hey, this is, this is a good certified device. It's nice and secure. I would hope that our colleagues that are building systems for the industrial IRT are putting more focus on uh, their design from, you know, secure by design, building security in from the start. We know for a fact that this is not happening in the consumer side of the house uh, in terms of IoT. So we we hope that that happens. But and the way that if you think about some of the recent executive orders and stuff that have been those types of things that have been happening recently, I would hope that some type of standard organization would come in to help to help with sort of you know certifying certain types of things i really think it's really going to it's at least beginning it's going to have to start off with those that are dealing more with you know human safety and reliability and life you know that's why i say industrial type of systems should definitely have to adhere to certain types of standards uh, but if you think about it i just said you know industrial systems what about a car like a tesla you know Huh. That deals with human safety, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. these cars communicate over the air or, you know, uh, with over networks and stuff. So um, people don't really quite realize that even maybe some of the gadgets we buy, a Tesla or um, <clears throat> even the thermostat in your house, you know, what could, but, you know, what could a hacker do to, you know, maybe set your house on fire? I'm, I'm just you know, something like that. So, <laughs> so <it's, not>. or, <laughs> or even turn it in, off. In summary, so what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So in summary, what I'm saying <laughs> is I, I think at some point we're going to have to have this. Um, I don't, yeah. especially when we think of the consumer world, um, you know, businesses are just concerned of throwing a piece of garbage out that they can sell, right? Largely in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, Interesting, you mentioned as far as executive orders and some of the, you know, and preceding that, it was really the, you know, the um, trade wars with China and, and then the back doors with uh, Huawei and ZTE and so forth. And then as the some of these events have rolled out, then it's the, you know, software, you know, bill of materials piece of it. Um, and then, as you mentioned, just all these innumerable devices. Um, and Lane, maybe I turn it back to you. Like, so, 
how would how how does somebody start to corral this problem, right? I mean, it's their government is working and making some um, inroads. Uh, industry, it's you know, kind of on their shoulders. The consumer is clueless, <laughs> you know, in general. Um, but from an operator standpoint, like what's what's the what's the first couple of steps or approaches that you'd recommend in order to try to try to even kind of quantify the problem? So from an operational perspective, operation like uh, how you're executing your business, okay, I'm just going to approach mm -hmm. it this way because I just gave a mm -hmm. presentation on this with InfraGuard a while back. But to me, in my mind, visibility in terms of corralling it in, so to speak, you know, how are you going to manage this inside of your organization? Visibility is first and foremost. You can't protect what you don't know you have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously at this point in time, you definitely need some – I was about to say, especially within the operational technology side of the house, but I'm going to say, no, no, across the entire board, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the entire spectrum of the ITOT space in an organization, if you bring in some, you know, crazy device like a, a Wi-Fi connected device you put in your kitchen for your employees to use, you know, you can't just do that and say, okay, this is an added benefit for my employees because, well, this device might be a foothold for you know, somebody sitting in the parking lot that wants to hack into your OT network, it could be a, a, a first entry point. So if visibility across the entire space of IT and OT is going to be first and foremost um, in this process. Okay. I'll let anyone else Henry, ask I, that if they like. Yeah, Henry, I see you, you, you're nodding uh, uh, violently yeah, there. Um, what, what would you like to add in there, Henry? Oh, I was just saying that uh, those entry points in and out of the of the OT environment if you have some kind of um, devices that can monitor that traffic and possibly even send logs or to a correlator that can trigger some sort of a uh, look into, hey, this is unusual traffic. But the first part, I was just agreeing with Lane that you have to have that visibility to see the anomaly. Because if you don't even have the visibility, you're you're just not going to see it. Yeah, yeah. And let me let me quickly okay. jump in and add something right quick. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, we I know we mentioned earlier this idea of an air gap. In my mind, the word air gap needs to go away because we can no longer provide a guaranteed air gap. But in terms of visibility, what I suggest anyone listening to me right now do is go on Google, and I hope the data is still there. And if not, if you contact me, I can show you because I have the image saved. But look, uh, go do a Google for Shodan plus uh, ICS uh, connected <coughs> devices. Um, you can see, so sh there was a project where, so Shodan is basically this uh, system that scans the internet looking for all types of devices, and they catalog them so that you can go do search queries and such. Um, so it's like a Google for finding out, you know, where devices are on the internet. And there was this one particular project where someone went out looking just for OT type devices that were directly connected to the internet. And it's massive. There are so many OT devices connected to the internet that you can't even imagine the, in terms of the scale. And so visibility in terms of if you know what's on your network, then the next step is you should know where it's connecting and how it's connecting. Yeah, on the yeah. on the Shodan front, I'll add, I, uh, Shodan's one of the things I teach my students when we're talking about um, industrial security. And the, you know, you can go and pick some devices and search for them or specific IPs, or they'll even give you on their, their industrial controls page some sample queries, but um, it's kind of scary um, if you start with just one result for a keyword. Um, these devices, because they were never designed to be connected directly to the internet, you can get right down to, um, I was able to trace one appliance directly to uh, an energy company in Romania and figure out, you know, it, it showed me what version it was, which from that website found out exactly what <laughs> vulnerabilities are in it. And it was not the latest version. It was all there. It was all public. Uh, and that's really frightening. And so that's one of the first things I show my students now when we're talking about uh, industrial security is like, this is something you need to think about, you know, when you get out there, because, you know, I don't think a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time necessarily go and look at some of those resources. They're, 
they're focused more on their internal security and not thinking necessarily about what is directly connected that may have been forgotten about or overlooked. And uh, the other thing I do with them that I encourage everyone on this call to go do is when we talked, you know, Lane talked a lot about visibility. Um, I have all of my students just on their home networks open up Visio and try and diagram every connected device on their home network. I tried for my apartment. My apartment's under 700 square feet. I still could not get every single connected device that I have. I, I looked at it and revisited it multiple times. And every time I scanned my network, I found new devices. If you can't diagram your entire home network, how are you ever going to know what's on your network in the enterprise, what's on your network on the factory floor? It's absolutely impossible. And so that really shows how important that visibility is, that ability to discover all your assets and know exactly what you're starting with uh, in order to build off of that work. Yeah, this is a uh, non-trivial. And as we mentioned earlier, or, you know, in terms of looking into the very near future, when we terms of scale, you know, when everybody wants to take a sensor that can connect over Wi-Fi, so to speak, just, you know, say you're building a digital twin inside of your uh, manufacturing organization, you want to hook up, uh, you know, a hundred sensors that are connecting to a, you know, into an engine that's sending data back to a cloud to form a digital twin. You know, that's mat that scale in terms of managing visibility. These are non-trivial problems that we're going to be dealing with in the very near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and I, and again, I feel like the, uh, you know, the hand waving or what have you about the software bill of materials. I mean, it's like retroactively. I mean, where what's installed? Like, I mean, again, the the visibility challenge is big enough, and then let alone trying to get <laughs> underneath the hood of these devices to figure out where and how you know where they're manufactured, you know, and so forth. I mean. Again, non-trivial just to be able to see these devices, <laughs> let alone yeah. trying to really um, trace them back. So um, tremendous challenges there. Um, and then also, I mean, I, I like how you've illustrated, and, I, and, and both of you have talked about just kind of the evolution of, of the industrial spaces. I mean, uh, coming out of the 90s and so forth. I mean, just pre-internet, if you will, um, not meant to be connected, you know. And so they're just a, a it is a relatively immature space. Um, but the learning cycle, the, the learning curve, if you will, is probably much, much steeper than IT, um, just because we, we do have the IT best practices and we do have the IT resources and we, we'd like their budget. Um, <laughs> but um, what I, I'm going to turn to maybe Henry, I'll turn <laughs> to you first, but um, what, how do you see IT getting involved with OT? How, how can we embrace them? Um, either again, I mentioned budget or resources or best practices or so forth. But how how do you see that convergence happening? Well, I, I think there could be some some good things that IT can offer us as far as some of the um, they've had to deal with remote access a lot longer than we have um, in the mm -hmm. sense that they've been doing it for a, quite a while and it's more of a new thing. Um, if we can take advantage of their systems and then, you know, then, then once they're authenticated against their systems and perhaps then they get access to a jump host that then our firewall then in the OT space then allows certain, maybe another set of authentication to happen. And then they can come in and do their work. Uh, maybe there could be some more depth in defense in, by mm -hmm. pulling remote access through the IT network and keep and, and, and then gaining that little extra wrapper of security that they might mm. have. But then there's also risk there too. Um, it depends on how well that IT space is secured. And, and that's where, uh, where I was coming from at the beginning that as we open up our OT spaces to these, these other environments that we don't control we're pretty much you know trusting or maybe we need to have them verify that they are controlled and secured properly mm -hmm. but i think if they yeah. are then we can add another level of security for people coming in and doing what they need to in the ot space interesting okay good ed 
Tyler, uh, kind of same question to you. I mean, how do you, how do you see IT being more involved in the industrial space, or, or again, just more more immediately, how can we leverage leverage them or be collaborative? Yeah, I think there's sort of two spaces um, where I'd like to see huge improvement and growth. Um, one is that a lot of sort of more active um, IT security technologies have sort of been pushed out of the OT space, and that's due to instability in OT products. Um, you know, we'll use printers as an example, even though they're not OT necessarily, but um, the idea that these products are built with very weak TCP stacks that can't handle a lot of the active discovery and active scanning techniques that we see because they just fall yeah. over. And while a printer can crash, a robotic arm performing surgery, you can't have that crash in the middle of an operation. That, that would be horrific. And so, you know, that is on the developers of these technologies that they need to start building more robust systems that are capable of handling this. And so I'd really love to see the vendors of these technologies take a more active step in making systems that are ro more robust, not even necessarily more secure. I'd love to get there. Let's just make them more robust and less fragile as a starting point. And the second hmm. one is I would love to see a lot more ITOT convergence when it comes to not necessarily the technologies, but red teaming and blue teaming exercises. So Henry was talking about when people hit this pivot point and go from your IT network to your OT network. Well, I don't see as many, even just if we talk about training courses, whether it's at the big cons, Black Hat, DEF CON sector, or whether it is private training courses, you know, the two or three day boot camp sort of things. You know, you see a lot of them on traditional pen testing. You're starting to see a lot of them now on sort of the cloud security, pen testing the cloud and cloud infrastructure. You don't see anything that's giving you, you know, two or three days of solid security training on here's how a pen tester comes in. Here's how they get your IT network. Here's how they find that pivot point. Here's how they hit uh, your OT software. And then how your blue team reacts to that. Like we're just seeing SOX gain popularity on the IT side we really need to see them gain more popularity on the OT side so that we have that end-to-end -end red team, blue teaming, purple teaming um, to put them both together and test them out. Uh, and I think that would make a huge difference. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Lane, I'll, I'll, let, I'll turn to you to, to answer as well. And then uh, that looks like we got a question from the audience. Um, so Lane, go ahead and then, uh, then we'll turn to the QA. Yeah. So, um... For those of us who are in engineering and development and things of that nature, um, I like to say that, uh, like Richard Feynman said one time, it was in his days, it was, he said it was a beautiful time to be a physicist. And to me as an engineer, I say it's a beautiful time to be an engineer because we're entering a new world where as an engineer, it's very exciting. And where I'm trying to go to with this is that one of the key things of doing this is uh, significant interdisciplinary collaboration between those involved, the IT and the control engineers and the OT folks working together. Mm -hmm. I was talking to someone today who works for Schneider Electric, and these folks are talking about building microservices and what we call a Lambda functions and microservices and stuff using containers running on Raspberry Pis inside of their OT networks. Now that's a lot of IT jargon if you're not in the IT space, but it's kind of advanced cloud computing technology that these control engineers are implementing down in the OT space. So they're learning a lot of IT technology. Uh, conversely, IT folks within these, you know, that, that are working in the industrial organization should be learning OT technologies as well. The uh, IT folks don't understand that in the shop floors, on the factory floors and stuff, safety and reliability comes first, then comes um, uh, confidentiality. Okay, so we have different mm -hmm. needs and stuff. And so currently right now we see there's a big disconnect from those of us who work and specialize in the IT space that have no understanding of the OT space. But at the same time, we have a lot of IT, uh, OT folks that are driving into the space of IT, but also are interested in security. So I think it's, an, in summary, I think it's an excellent opportunity, a perfect time and an excellent opportunity for us to work together more openly uh, and, and collaboratively. 
Okay. All right. Well, um, I, this has been a great uh, conversation. Uh, again, I, it looks like it stimulated a, at least one question, and I would uh, you know, look the rest of the audience to go ahead and, and put in some more questions. Uh, you've got, a, again, a tremendous amount of bandwidth here, and then even if we run out of bandwidth, then uh, maybe our audience members could help answer as well. Um, but the, I'll turn to the first question here from, from Simon. Um, I mean, I'm going to read it, and then I'll, I'll look to the to the group to help answer. Um, but from an ITOT security standpoint, would you recommend an appliance that speaks native DMP3 Modbus protocols as the inspection appliance, or can the modem next-gen firewall do a respectable job? So I I I, I would I would. So I'm, I'm I personally not a an expert into the mm -hmm. protocols that are used in the OT space. That's why I said I was mm -hmm. more on the IT side that has a very strong interest into the OT side. But I think when you ask a question like this, generally speaking, I think you need to figure out what, what are you trying to, what, what type, what are you trying to detect or inspect. Mm -hmm. So if we think about a particular security paradigm we have to deal with in the in the OT space, in our modern world. Signal spoofing is a particular problem. So if you've uh, if you've got uh, an attacker on your network that is trying to disrupt a uh, a real world process by spoofing signals that may be sent to the HMI, then your next gen firewall is not going to do that. Your next gen firewall is going to be looking at IP based traffic, unless there's a next gen firewall that. Um, speaks to the NP or yeah. Modbus. I, I personally, I'm not sure yeah. about yeah. that. So I think the okay. question here is, Experience. are you looking for anomalies in the signal space, so to speak? Or are you looking for anomalies and bad traffic in the IP space, internet protocol space, the ethernet, yeah. you know, uh, okay. networks? Henry, Henry, what do you, you had some thoughts there, Henry? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I agree with Elaine. You got to decide which space you're looking at. For, for a firewall, a next-gen firewall, they can do deep packet inspection. They can stop, you know, DMP writes. They can only allow reads, um, but they are on the IP space. So, I mean, that's the limit there for yeah. them. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I can throw in a little bit. I mean, I, I'm, I was, as I was reading the question, trying to understand it as well, but um, I mean, the, the OT space is littered with protocols, right? I mean, the, most of the OT asset identification vendors have 100 plus protocols in there. So I don't, I can't really differentiate DMP3 Modbus from any of the others, um, unless you want to get into encrypted protocols, you know, they're coming over the horizon. But um, so, so it's always going to be a, a protocol driven um, uh, application from a passive standpoint. Um, and then even some of these uh, solutions have selectively active capabilities that are also protocol driven. Um, and then, yeah, next gen firewall, whether you're, you're whether you're talking intrusion detection, um, that then is it leads into intrusion protection. Again, that detection is coming from those dissectors using protocols as well. So, um, I I think that it's, it's inherent that you know name your protocol is going to be in the environment. Um, it's uh, usually the proof of concept is going to validate whether um, if those products or solutions have the protocol library to support it. Um, and then, you know, do you have the firewall uh, as well? Um, so there's, there's two different technologies involved there, both protocol driven. And really, I guess it's just a matter of vetting it out to see if it covers, um, you know, the protocol you need. Um, good. All right. Uh, Let's see, Rustin's got some uh, question here. What are the biggest cybersecurity threats right now? Uh, ransomware, hackers, internal breaches. Uh, I'll throw in remote access, um, industrial espionage. Uh, uh, let's, uh, so we've got 20 minutes left. Let's make this a little more of a, of a quick hitter. So uh, Tyler, uh, you go ahead um, and then I'll go Lane and Henry and then I'll throw in my two cents. So go ahead, Tyler. Sure. I mean, I would say, can we say all of the above? I mean, if you look at the news right now, it's it's probably ransomware um, that's that's driving yeah. a lot of the news that we're seeing. There's definitely a huge increase, increase in that. Um, but I, I think the biggest actual threat to your cybersecurity um, comes back to how does all of that get in there? Uh, and it's probably your users and lack of user awareness training. 
Um, I think most organizations need to do a much better job of making their users aware of what they can and can't do, what they can and can't click on. And that's always going to be a huge threat until we figure out a better way to deal with that. Okay. Good. Lane, go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, I was actually looking up some data right quick that I have. Um, <laughs> Dragos, which is, you know, a very well, uh, popular cybersecurity group in the OT space. In the ICS mm -hmm. space, they uh, they produce what's called the uh, year in um, year in review, and so uh, they've recently been, definitely been seeing an uptick in phishing. Phishing leads to ransomware often, if and nowadays probably most you know ransomware um, is usually you know the, one of our biggest threats, and the vector to get in is often phishing. And, and I think Tyler just mentioned this, and that's based off of poor self-awareness and such, but they're seeing an increase in threat actors uh, in, in hackers, so to speak, uh, uh, groups that implement advanced persistent threats, APTs as we call them, that are starting to focus and drill in on ICS networks, industrial control system networks, and they are starting to actually see, and I know this is this takes a lot of dedication and motivation depending on your target, but they are starting to see malware evolve that is trying to get into, you know, the lower levels of our um, OT environments, you know, from the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, engineering workstations that might be running old operating systems, which we know is a, is a big challenge that we have to deal with. So, uh, yeah, ransomware, malware that is going to eventually start evolving to particularly target industrial control system devices. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, okay. Henry, what do you think? Well, I think um, in this environment where everyone's trying to work from home and uh, take advantage of remote access, it just accentuates the risk that we've talked about that Lane and Tyler just talked about because it, it opens up more doors and so there's more avenues for those vectors to hit those remote users and and do their job, you know, do what they 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 plan to do. So I think it it all works, <laughs> all of the above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe this year we was saying all of the above. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe that this yeah. year we saw an uptick in research targeting VPNs, for example, um, security right. uh, vulnerabilities in VPN software. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess from my standpoint, it's um, follow the money. Um, and certainly ransomware is, uh, is the most present monetization of hacking, but follow that money could it, honestly, it could be those APT crews, um, you know, with the, uh, the, the greatest loss of intellectual property that's happened over the years. Um, you could talk, look at it from the militaristic standpoint, again, nation states and some espionage going on. Some of the, some of the best known OT um, events, cyber events have been, you know, been nation state uh, involved as they're, you know, setting the battlefield and what have you. So there's a lot, I mean, the ransomware piece of it catches attention. Um, then there's some obscure events that go on and it kind of scratches your head. And, um, but what we know is just going back to, again, this industrial space is just, is just ripe. Uh, for any uh, kind of motivation, um, but uh, but that ransomware piece of it is is really um, not only is it shutting you down, um, but then you're paying a ransom on top of it and losing that time rebuilding everything. So, I think that that is the biggest headache probably right now. But um, you know, if you strictly focused on that, you'd be missing the other threats as well. Um, all right, uh, so let's go to let's go to Glenda here. Has got. Uh, question says, when you describe a network as robust, what do they what do they need a basic uh, checklist to say they are at least protected from major threats? So, I guess again, what makes something robust? Um, and then again, the major threats, um, what you know, a checklist or maybe what's a, a, some basic controls? Um, again, I'll we're. We're going on 15 minutes here, and I need to turn it back over to Mary Beth shortly. But Tyler, is there uh, maybe a little bit of a, a laundry list there that uh, could get you know get somebody in a position to have a robust <clears throat> network or, or checklist on on vulnerabilities or threats? Yeah, I uh, I'll I'll keep this short and try not to be 
uh, too much of a vendor plug here, but uh, <laughs> I mean the CIS controls, um, you know, the the 18 CIS controls um, that were updated this year. Um, I think that's a great starting point. I think if you can get through those controls, um, that's robust. And if you have questions about them, the Tripwire blog, State of Security, uh, has been reviewing one control a week for the last 14 weeks. We got four more weeks of it to go uh, with full walkthroughs of what each of them are. But I think if you can look at those controls and say, hey, I'm practicing all of that on my network, I would consider you to be a robust network at that point. Nice. Good advice. Uh, Lane, what do you think? No, I have to, I have to spot on. And uh, just to add to that, if we, you know, let's not think about five or 10 years down the road right now, let's look at what are, you know, the most common network architectures we have in the industry, in industry, industrial organizations. What I always like to say is that IT, that's their entry point. We, I know we talked about uh, devices that might be connected to the internet, but you know, applying these controls, especially critical in the top of your IT organizations, because that's how the attackers are getting in to get into your OT networks. And let's keep in mind, and in, in, not on top of that, in many, many cases, you know, breaking into the IT network can, in certain cases, shut down your OT networks. Uh, Colonial Pipeline is a perfect example of that particular case. Yeah. Okay. Henry, some thoughts on that space as well? Uh, yeah, I think um, a good network design uh, is is helpful in creating a robust network. Uh, I think if you look at the NIST guidelines for ICS networks, that would be a good place to start um, to get some just basic good network design and, and robustness for your networks. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, checking the q and I don't see any other questions uh, as of right now, but I, I will round it out with um, Mary Beth will probably send out the slide maybe with our bios and our emails. I mean, I, 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 I can speak for the group that we'll make ourselves uh, available for any follow on questions. Um, they'd like to approach us afterwards or what have you. I, I mean, I, again, we'd like to we'd always like happy hour to last forever, <laughs> but we do have a little bit of a time constraint here. Um, but with but with that, I want to thank the group um, and, and, again, thank the audience uh, for their participation as well. Um, I've definitely learned some things here today. Um, and uh, being robust and being protected is, is why we're sitting in these seats. Um, and we will continue on this journey because there, there is no end point. Um, because the, the bad people out there uh, continually get creative um, and uh, keep us dutifully employed and active. <laughs> but it would be nice to be able to turn the corner on that and, and be, be able to sleep a little bit better at night. So um, to that, yeah, uh, Mary Beth, I agree. I'll, yeah, I'll turn it back to you, Mary Beth. And, and again, thank you yeah. all. And uh, don't hesitate in following up with us. Yeah, um, thank you guys. I thought that was really entertaining. Um, and Henry, maybe you could jot down the website you just mentioned in the chat for folks oh. that might be of interest oh. um a bit back there but don't leave everybody even though it's time to drain your glass and get ready to go home as a thank <laughs> you we're going to surprise you all with a raffle uh for an amazon gift certificate so hey liz can you spin the wheel for folks yeah, so I've got everyone's names in a random name generator, so you can't see it, but imagine that there is a wheel spinning right now. <laughs> and it's going. All right, we have got Devin B is the winter, winner. So, Devin, I will reach out to you with your gift card. Great. All right. So, um, folks, as uh, Richard mentioned, We've been recording this. We're going to go ahead and send the recording out to you when it's available with the slide deck so that you have everybody's name. Actually, Liz, you want to throw up that last slide because maybe some of these folks want to know who their Belden and Tripwire account executives would be. So just grab that. And um, we'll also be asking those of you that have joined us for your address because we're going to send you out um, a book, the tools and weapons book that we mentioned in our email. Um, and hey, everybody, stay tuned because we're going to invite you to another Belden Tripwire Industrial Security Pub Talk 
in Q1 2022. Amazing. Mm. Thanks, guys. Well, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. See you.